confessions. The office bearers were required to sign it, though the elders not yet at this time. Dort said, we'll leave it up to the individual classes to decide whether or not elders and deacons need to sign it. But the point is that particularly in the teaching office of minister, there must be unity in doctrine. If there is not unity in doctrine in the teaching office, then this minister is teaching this idea, and this minister is teaching that idea, and the churches, instead of being unified, are being driven apart. For unity's sake, they needed this form. To guard the truth, they needed the form. Because there were Armenians who were teaching false doctrines, teaching that God loves everyone, that God wants to save everyone, and all the rest. They needed this to protect the truth already contained in the Heidelberg Catechism in seed form, already contained in the Belgic Confession even more explicitly, but they needed to have a form that would say, we reject all that which is repugnant to these confessions, to guard the truth. What then does the form require? The back side of the program contains the formula of subscription, And we really need to read that and see what is meant, what is being signed by an office bearer. We, the undersigned professors of the Protestant Reformed churches, ministers of the gospel, elders and deacons of the Protestant Reformed congregation of such and such, of classes such and such, do hereby sincerely and in good conscience before the Lord declare by this our subscription that we heartily believe and are persuaded that all the articles and points of doctrine contained in the confession and catechism of the Reformed churches, together with the explanation of some points of the aforesaid doctrine made by the National Senate of Dortrud, 16, 18, 19, do fully agree with the Word of God. Now that's the first thing, the first significant. There are four specific, significant things that this form does And this is the first one and even the most important. Every office bearer is saying, I in good conscience believe that all the articles and points of doctrine in the confessions do fully agree with the Word of God. I call your attention, first of all, that it sets forth what confessions we maintain. That's not left open for discussion. They are listed, the three confessions that are maintained. I call your attention, secondly, that there is absolutely no exception allowed. There are churches, Presbyterian churches, where a man can say, as he is coming into the denomination as a minister or an elder, I believe in the system of doctrine that is found in the Westminster Confession, but I have certain scruples or certain exemptions that I would like you to grant me. I don't believe in this and this, and I don't believe in that and that. And now the church can decide whether they still will allow that man to be a minister or an elder, even though he has those reservations. This form does not allow that. This form says, all the articles and points of doctrine that are found in the confessions do fully agree with the Word of God. No exceptions. Not that they more or less agree with the Word of God. They fully agree with the Word of God. This is not a blanket approval of every statement of the confessions. For example... When the Belgic Confession says that Paul is the writer of Hebrews, that's a point of information. You may disagree with that if you want. That's not a point of doctrine. There have been people who have tried to say, well, you don't believe in the confessions either. You don't believe everything the confessions teach. And you say, well, yes, I do. And they say, well, do you believe this? Do you believe Paul wrote Hebrews? And 
You might say yes, and you might say no, I don't believe that. And then they say, well, see, you don't believe in all the confessions then. Don't let them do that. The office bearer is saying, I believe in all the doctrines and all the articles, rather, and points of doctrine that are contained in the confessions that they fully agree with the word of God. So points of information are not doctrine. Secondly, there may be a point of exegesis in the creeds that you might not quite agree with. A point of exegesis, not a doctrine, but a point of exegesis. Let me just give you an example. The Belgian Confession says that Judas Iscariot partook of the Lord's Supper the night before Jesus was crucified. I don't believe that. But that's an exegetical question, looking at the, conf- at the four Gospels and deciding what really happened on that last night. The confessions say Jesus, that Judas partook. You may disagree with that. That's not a doctrine. That's not a doctrine. That's a point of exegesis, which you may disagree on. But you may not take one of the articles and say, well, this whole article I don't agree with. Or this particular doctrine, I don't agree with. An office bearer says, all the articles, all the Lord's days, and every point of doctrine fully agree with the Word of God. An extremely pointed, specific statement. Let's go on. The formula of subscription says in the second paragraph, we promise, therefore diligently to teach and faithfully to defend the aforesaid doctrine without either directly or indirectly contradicting the same by our public preaching or writing. We will teach these things. We will defend them. That's obvious. This is the Reformed faith. We will teach it. We will defend it against anyone that attacks it. In all our work, we will teach and defend it. Thirdly, we declare... In the next paragraph, moreover, that we will not only reject all errors that militate against this doctrine, and particularly those which were condemned by the above-mentioned Senate, Senator Dort, but that we are disposed to refute and contradict these and to exert ourselves in keeping the church free from such errors. So the third thing is, we promise to be aggressive in rejecting all doctrine that's contrary to the creeds. It's not enough merely that we will say, I believe the creed, and even I'll defend it if somebody attacks the doctrines, but I will go after the errors that militate against it. I will refute them. I will expose them and reject them. That's what an office bearer is promising. They are required to do this. If your minister does not do this, you understand, he's not faithful to his vow. And neither are the elders that oversee his work. And if you have a minister that is preaching against false doctrine, and particularly Arminianism, don't say to him, don't do that. Tell him, you're doing what the form says you have to do. This is what every office bearer promises to do, to reject all error that militates against false doctrine, against, rather, the doctrine of the confessions. Fourthly, it is a promise to be honest. And if hereafter any difficulties or different sentiments respecting the aforesaid doctrine should arise in our minds, all right, I signed it as an office bearer. And I believe everything that all the articles and points of doctrine. But now, ten years down the road, I'm beginning to wonder about a particular article in the Confessions. What do I do with that? What do I do? If if some difficulty arises in our minds, we promise that we will neither publicly nor privately propose, teach, or defend the same, either by preaching or writing, until we have first revealed such sentiments to the consistory, classes, and synod, that the same, our ideas, may there be examined, being ready always cheerfully to submit to the judgment of the consistory, classes, and synod under the penalty in case of refusal to be by that very fact, suspended from our office. 
The next paragraph I won't read right now, but basically it says this. And if somebody, if a church body, my consistory, my classes, my synod, has some ideas that maybe I'm not very, very sound,